very much for having me and um, hopefully the next three hours will be interesting. Um, we're going to talk um, about exploratory laparotomy and then um, really with this first lecture I want to go through just a few tips and tricks and a few things to think about when we're doing this type of surgery just to try and, and that's something that is done um, very commonly in general practice and I think with a few tips and you know some, some instruments and things like that um, you can certainly make um, the job a lot easier for yourself and also um, hopefully get some better results for your patients. Um, the second lecture is going to focus uh, specifically on small and large intestinal surgery. Again, um, we're going to go through some tips and tricks um, and then also um, just talk about some basic procedures that, that you guys do and hopefully, um, again, just aiming at trying to make your job easier and, and, and improve patient outcomes in your practice. So in this first lecture, uh, what we're really going to look at initially is um, perioperative management. Um, we're going to touch on uh, instrumentation, some of my favourite instruments, um, some of the things that you know I just can't do surgery without these days. Um, we're going to then look at some general principles of abdominal surgery and then uh, just go through some biopsy techniques for various organs inside the abdominal cavity. So just first up, um, when we're considering doing an exploratory laparotomy, I guess the first thing we need to recognise is that there are a huge number of indications and um, they're really wide and varied and you know, patients really can present in various degrees of stability and this is really important to consider because we have to give these patients a general anaesthetic and you have to consider whether the patient is actually stable enough um, for that anaesthetic um, before you get started. And this initial patient assessment is really the key um, before you administer the anaesthetic and it's better to recognise a problem beforehand rather than afterwards when you, you have a real issue. The images at the bottom here just talk about, again, sometimes we're going in and we've got a, a case where there's an acute abdomen, septic peritonitis, um, the dogs are, or cats are, are very unstable cardiovascularly, um, other cases we're going in to try and um, diagnose inflammatory bowel disease, something like that and we're just taking some intestinal biopsies and when we do that, obviously the animal is in a much um, better you know, position for an anaesthetic. So this initial patient assessment, I'm not going to talk in a huge amount of detail about these things um, because it's a little bit beyond the scope of this lecture, but the initial patient assessment in my opinion, the things that we need to think about are a really close examination of the cardiovascular system, um, assessing for you know, signs of shock, um, making sure they're in a, a stable state and they're going to be able to get through the anaesthetic unscathed. We really want to look at doing blood work. Um, you know, it's not uncommonly that we do blood work on a, a relatively stable or normal animal, or what we think is normal, and find some level of abnormality, be it in liver function or renal function. And, you know, sometimes these key things can impact your decision-making process when you're giving an anaesthetic. The other thing that I think is really important is to get good imaging, um, and imaging really gives us as much, you know, the aim of this is trying to give us as much information as we can um, before we actually commit to doing the surgery to try and minimise the flight decisions that we have to make. And then the final thing with this initial patient assessment is making sure we've got adequate analgesia on board and then looking at different ways we can actually give analgesia to try and have the, the safest anaesthetic and have the animals as comfortable as they can be. So when we're looking at the cardiovascular system initially, um, the things you want to look at really, you know, these are all in the textbooks and, you know, we're looking at mentation, we're looking at heart rate, respiration rate, temperature. Uh, you want to have a look at the mucous membrane colour and refill time. Again, if you can check blood pressure, that's really helpful. Um, if you can check urine output by putting a urinary catheter in as well, that can be very beneficial. And sometimes, you know, we want to check lactate and see if that changes once we start giving fluids. And it's really the more critical cases, cases where, you know, they've been hit by a car and we're exploring the abdomen for a bleed or splenic rupture, um, patients where they've got a, um, a septic abdomen, you're really wanting to make sure their blood pressure and urine output um, are adequate, make sure they're not in aneurysm renal failure um, or really, really severe shock before you start. The most common, I guess, modern uh, way of managing shock is to try and work towards a goal-based assessment um, and management process when we're looking at shock and really what we're doing there is looking at um, various goals in terms of heart rate, blood pressure and you know mean arterial pressure, those kind of things. When we're treating we want to try and get those those parameters back toward you know towards a more normal uh, value. So there's you know that's the way that people are currently thinking about that. And it's really important to manage this shock aggressively before we um, we give the anaesthetic. 
Um, I just put a note in here about just being aware of compensated and hyperdynamic shock. This is the first stage of shock and this is where you know, you're going to have an increase um, potentially in the blood pressure um, and the heart rate might be normal. Um, the mucous membrane colour is often very red and you know, the CRT is often less than one and these cases are having significant vasoconstriction and they're actually able to cope at the moment and it's interesting once you actually start to give these cases fluids, uh, for instance, you give them a bolus, you see that the heart rate starts to come back down to a normal range and the blood pressure starts to come back down to a normal range as well. But it's important not to just think these animals are normal. Um, if you have a suspicion of shock or a suspicion of hypovolemia, it's really important to manage that aggressively. And I've just put a couple of pictures in there to remind me you know, things that we're commonly doing in addition to just routine crystalloid fluids is using things like volubin, um, which is a colloid, um, and you know, reaching for presses like dobutamine or dopamine um, and we're commonly using those and using them more and more to try and make sure these patients are stable before we start the anaesthetic. The other thing to remember is that sometimes surgery is required to treat the problem um, and this is really important when you have a liver mass or a splenic mass that's bleeding and that you, know, you can only go so far with fluids and preoperative treatment um, to get these animals stable and at some point actually you might need to get in there and treat these guys with surgery to actually correct the bleeding. Um, it's important to recognise if you have a bleeding splenic mass, something like that, that you want to be careful with your volume resuscitation and people talk about a low volume resuscitation where you're not giving a huge amount of crystalloid fluids, you're giving more colloids and presses and things like that to actually try and um, improve the cardiovascular status before you start. I'll put this slide in here um, as a reminder that I, in my opinion, I really think that if you're doing any kind of exploratory abdominal surgery, um, intravenous fluids should not be an option and I guess I've been pretty spoiled. I've been working in specialist practice for about 10 years now um, and you know everything goes on fluids as having an anaesthetic but I understand that in general practice there are different pressures, often financial pressures associated with a lot of cases but the cost of putting an animal on fluids is really you know, not terrible and I think that you know, most times you should just incorporate that in your anaesthetic fee. And it really makes a big difference having that vascular access, um, you know, even in some cases where they start off stable, everything's going well. Um, it doesn't take much for them to be pushed over the edge and for, for things to deteriorate. And if you have that catheter in and you have the ability to give drugs and fluids, then it can make things a lot safer. So the next part of this talk is about the preoperative imaging and, you know, really this is about knowing your enemy and trying to know as much about what's going on before you start. Um, it's very uncommon and again I'm pretty spoiled these days that I do any abdominal surgery without the benefit of at least an ultrasound and in most cases I'm going to have done a CT scan and you know that gives us a really good look inside the dog's belly um, or cat's belly before we even start and so you know I know what I'm getting into. So again this is really about trying to minimise the decision making on the fly um, to hopefully try and improve your outcomes in the long run. X-rays, um, probably the most common imaging that's available in general practice and you know almost every practice would have um, an X-ray machine there and the ability to, to make these films. Um, when we're looking at X-rays, this example is a, a dog that has an intestinal obstruction and in this case it's a relatively straightforward diagnosis. You know the small intestine is very dilated, um, it's easily 1.6 times the body of L5 in terms of its width. Um, and in this case, you know, I think you'd have every um, indication to, to go in and do surgery. But in a lot of cases, as you know, when you, you have a dog that's been vomiting and you're umming and ahhing about what's going on, sometimes the x-rays aren't as clear cut as that. People often use contrast studies when they're looking at the abdomen and using x-rays. Um, to be honest, I don't do a lot of these contrast studies and again, we have a CT scan in our practice. So this is probably one of the main reasons. Um, on the left here we have a, a relatively normal contrast study with um, barium moving from the stomach through the small intestine in a fairly um, even fashion and on the right here we have a, an x-ray with some, um, some unadministered BIPs and again BIPs are something where you know, there's small uh, radiopaque spheres and there's large radiopaque spheres and the idea is that the small spheres can get past some obstructions but the large ones um, won't typically be able to do that. Again, I find interpreting these x-rays really challenging. Um, you know, occasionally we get these kind of films sent into us to review um, and it's really, really hard to, to interpret these and so um, you have to be careful and you know, it might be better with experience and you know, I'm certainly, um, you know, I certainly recognise that people that use these things a lot might have a better um, ability to interpret those things. So these things are available. 